So if there's only one substance, if there's only one, we could also call it being or existence, one essence, then somehow every individual, every speck of consciousness, every soul, if you will, everything that's animate, everything that has the power to know, and if it's evolved enough, the power to move, the power to express, you know, the more evolved the form, the life form becomes, the more it's able to have a sort of an aut autonomous expression of itself and an autonomous self knowledge of itself. But if there's only one substance, then it doesn't matter how advanced you get, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're an ET from the 1200th dimension, and you can move objects with your mind, and you can be in uh, a thousand places at once, and you can know yourself fully and that and that. The essence, if there's only one essence, if there's only one substance, one infinite eternal substance, then somehow that individual experience or expression must still be made of that. There's many expressions of wood, but every table is made of wood. Well, that's not true, but you get the point. So, you know, there's many different waves, uh, large waves, small waves, ripples, there's bubbles in the ocean, but it's all made of absolute knowledge. It's all made of water. So I'm a believer and experiencer, direct perceiver of this unity, this oneness, the fact that the essence of all experiences is of the same nature, it's of the same essence. Where delusion comes in, or or ignorance, and therefore also suffering and dissatisfaction, or the whatever the opposite, or the obscuration, if that's a word, of happiness. Is that a word? Is that a word? Obscuration? It is now. It is now. <laughs> cool. So, the eclipsing of happiness, or self-knowledge, if happiness happens to be self-knowledge, which in my experience, the greater my self knowledge, the greater my happiness, or my perception of happiness, you could say, maybe happiness is actually the nature of reality. And the degree to which we're able to perceive that nature is the degree to which we perceive our innate happiness. Maybe it's not a thing that we accomplish or acquire. Maybe it's a matter of transparency more than anything else. Because if we are of that same nature, then all there is is degrees of distortion, how much this self knowledge is eclipsed. And so purification would be the antidote, the purification of the filters, the purification of perception, the purification of intention, the purification of assumptions, the purification of direct perception will lead to a transparent filter, aka an individual mind or being. And if that filter, aka the individual sense of me is purified is emptied out, this is where emptiness comes in as a helpful tool, then the more transparent this wave of the ocean is to the fact that it is water, and the less it is assuming that it is a wave of this size and this shape and this dimension and this movement and this speed and so forth and this memory in this past. One of the biggest eclipsers, is that a word? <laughs> of, of this innate intrinsic happiness, which is again, simply the recognition, the direct perception of an expression of life, of the life itself that enables that expression. So it's the expression of life, recognizing life itself, recognizing its indivisible substratum its true nature, beyond the concepts of this or that beyond any constructs beyond any assumptions. Now, one of the greatest eclipsers is the sense perceptions. They pull in a sense a veil over the eyes of the mind. Because we're always gauging ourselves by what we're seeing, what we're feeling, what we're hearing, and so forth. And we don't realize until we start to really investigate it, and, but even then, it keeps surprising us, the degree to which sense perceptions condition our assumption of self, and our assumption of limitation, because one of the eclipsers is to believe that we're limited to believe things that are not true, 
to believe that I'm this, that I'm that, that I'm such and so, and I need to work on this and that particular thing. If not, then da da da. Or I need to acquire this or all these trivialities, if you will, or these surface ripples that are so heavily identified with by life in the form of that individuated expression, that individuated ability to have autonomous intelligence, which doesn't mean separation, just because you have autonomous intelligence, and I have an autonomous intelligence. It is an assumption to therefore say, you and I are not one. In infinite unity, everything is possible. Any expression can exist and will exist and does exist. And the journey is experienced by that aspect of life, but it is an aspect of an indivisible whole, an indivisible unity, an indivisible source that is ever radiating, ever the same throughout all expressions, throughout all life forms, regardless of its state of evolution, whether it's the rock, rockness, whether it's a more evolved rock that stands on its own in the middle of nowhere, that has more of an identity, whether it is basic plant life, mineral life, and so forth, where movement begins, where growth begins, where the desire, the instinctual desire for self-knowledge in the form of movement, of spatial recognition, space-time experience starts to dawn, or whether it is in the animal, which is already becoming more autonomous, more able to be aware of itself as an autonomous expression of life, or whether it's in a human being, or whether it's in whatever is next. The essence is never changed. The form, the expression, the autonomous nature of that form to be able to know itself has changed. But the essence has been the same. And it's the same throughout. So actually, separation is the assumption from this vantage point. Unity is not an assumption. God is not an assumption. Eternal, infinite, all encompassing life is not an assumption. Limitation, separation, uh, real individuality, solid individuality. All these things are assumptions from this vantage point of the direct perception of the nature, the spontaneous ever present nature of appearances or experiences or phenomena or consciousness. So since everything is that, it can be a little bit of a stalemate. So then, then therefore what? Like everything is source, everything is the one, everything is the one eternal being. And that typically doesn't satisfy, at least not if that stays conceptual, because that's just another framework posed by a mental construct that is an expression of the indivisible unity, which is life itself. And now it's putting forth as part of its ability to evolve and to think for itself, an image of the one indivisible self which is, you could say, a marker, a pointer on its way back to source. But as long as it doesn't satisfy, and by satisfy, I mean deeply satisfy, deeply fulfill, deeply evoke a sense of wholeness, of oneness, of completion, of perfection, then it is a construct that mimics. It's a painting of the Grand Canyon. It's not the Grand Canyon. No. It's a painting of a nice lasagna when you're hungry, instead of an actual lasagna. So we can have pictures of God, and we all do, and all the religions do, and so forth. But it's different than opening the door of self, the back door, I should say, perhaps, although it doesn't really matter where you imagine it to be. But it's kind of like a back door, because our experience of the front of us, what's in front of us is always sense perceptions and thoughts and emotions and disturbances and individually described or describable phenomena. These phenomena appear, they are known. No phenomena has ever been known without being known. It's pretty indisputable fact, I would say. No phenomena has ever been known without being known. So if if we wish to minimize in the quest for a more sort of absolute self knowledge or absolute self awareness, if we wish to minimize our assumptions, we have to first of all look at our direct experience 
and consider what it is made of. What is, because what is phenomena except for experience? I could also say there's never been a phenomena, at least that we know of, apart from experience. What we call things are only known as experience. There is no other avenue for us, right? So we got to, we got to use the means that we have that we can rely on that is our direct experience that we can testify, so to speak. And all we can really say if we investigate purely enough, in a sense, quietly enough, or directly enough, or pristinely enough, is that I have never known a thing other than experience. So I might call this table a, th a thing, I might call my body a thing, I might call the world a thing. But I only know it, all I've ever met or encountered is an experience. And if you spend some deliberate time, maybe not now, but to try to dispute this, you will gain conviction naturally, spontaneously, and profoundly in this truth. And it, that alone can cut through a lot of assumptions and a lot of delusions and a lot of dissatisfaction that seemingly disconnects you from your recognition of the essential, intrinsic, spontaneous, ever-present nature of primordial wakefulness or original purity or the emptiness of things. Now, this doesn't sound very appealing typically to a mind that has become reliant for its sense of self, for its identity upon sense perceptions with the assumption, which is what we typically do, we have sense perceptions with the assumption. This is why we can counter it. This is why we can work to release ourselves from that. We have sense perceptions with the assumption attributed to it unconsciously, automatically all the time, that it is a real thing that exists apart from perception, consciousness, experience, but we've never ever, if we stop to pause to think, reason with true logic, with direct observation, combined with intuitive logic, we would have to conclude that none of our experiences ever has escaped them being experiences. Like we don't know anything about experience. So we gotta, we gotta work with what we have, what is actually the case. And there's so many assumptions about what's real and what's that about. But so, so it is the case when we're dreaming at night. We're convinced that there's an actual world, that there's actual people, actual things, independent, phenomena independent from us observing it. From, let's say, the field of experience or experience. But then when we wake up, we realize, oh, I heard sounds, but I had no ears. I saw a world, but I had no eyes. I touched another human being. I had sex with that human being, or I was in a fight with that human being, yet I had no body. I tasted delicious food, yet I had no tongue. I really thought that I was experiencing something that existed with something that existed. Now, the means that we have in the dream are the same as the means that we have here, which is consciousness experiencing. Again, if we bring it back down to its most naked observation, when we're dreaming at night, it's the mind, you could say, or consciousness, having an experience, consciousness and perception, consciousness and perception, consciousness and perception. Can you find any other means in the waking state? without assuming, because even, even I have a brain as a real thing is an assumption if we gauge it by direct experience. Now we've all been told this, we can dissect each other and see that there's a brain that does this and that. So one might reason that there is a brain. But again, if we go to our direct experience, and we only stay with what we can verify, what we can know for sure, then in my experience, all we can say is that I am, I know that I am, and I have the perception of experiences. I can't say I've ever experienced a thing itself. I can only say that I have experienced experiences. 
So if we look deeper into this, and we begin to sort of open ourselves to this recognition of that which is not confined to any of our objects of perception, but which is here right now hearing my voice. There is a quality that cannot be described by any of our science books, that cannot be described by studying history, that cannot be described by studying bio biology. It's the indisputable fact that you hear what I'm saying right now. And it's not even so much that you hear what I'm saying, it's the fact that you know that you hear what I'm saying. And that cannot be described. Me hearing you could be described, oh, I have a brain wired to the ears, sound is produced from your body and travels through the air, makes vibrations, I catch it, and I interpret it, and I have the experience of sound. But what cannot be described by any biology or um, a world of science, at least thus far, is how come I can know that I hear what you're saying? Perception can be described in the means of different categories of perceptions to extent can be described. But the mystery of being, the mystery of existing, the mystery of existence, the mystery of I am conscious and I know that I am, cannot be described, cannot be defined. We can try to, but it will never be the actual thing. The original purity of the essential knowing nature of the mind or self cannot be put into any form or mold without losing its truth. It can be described, but then it's another experience that it is having. So if we consider the self to be the container, perhaps, and that's a bit of an assumption, but that's sort of a description that you could come up with through direct investigation, where the self or I am is recognized to be the essential, kind of like a container, not with edges and dimensions and stuff, but acts as a container does, as space does to objects. So does the self or the essential knowing nature of being of I am, the essential knowing nature of perception, the essentially the essential knowing nature, that originally pure, empty nature, that cannot be disputed, of I exist, when it's recognized, it can be experienced directly, not by the senses, but directly, as the space of which the realm of perception, including what we term objects, is actually made of or consists of. So container, essence, space, those are analogies for the essential nature of mind. In some Buddhist um, teachings, they call this the citta, C-I-T-T-A. And I like that word for some reason, because it doesn't mean anything to us. So citta, to give it some meaning, would be the essential knowing nature of mind, the essential knowing nature of this moment. And in essence, in its truest state, this essential knowing nature of mind is nothing but pure knowing, without knowledge. It is pure knowing, like a void that radiantly, spontaneously, intrinsically, mysteriously knows. It is pure knowing, knowing itself not knowing as a brain or as a this or as a that, because those are perceptions that can be transcended, that can be deconstructed, that can be understood to the point that of their dissolution. Dissolution doesn't mean the table disappears per se, although it can too, in perception anyway. But it means that the solidity of it that is attributed through assumption, through years of uninvestigated assuming, based on sense object living, day to day, day to day, day to day, conditioning yourself, bumping into things, I'm this body, I'm this, I feel this, da da da. Without investigating the essential nature of that perception over and over again, leaving it uninvestigated, it forms a reality of its own in the back of our minds. 
And now we think we're relating to this thing that is independently real. We now think of phenomena as independently real. Whereas if we bring it back to direct experience, we see that it is a myth, that it is an assumption. And since the quest for truth requires us to minimize our assumptions and to increase our the pristineness, the purity of our direct perception, our ability to perceive directly, which is what meditation is for. Therefore, the journey is a process of purifying the filter of mind, the lens of perception, the sense of me, basically, because the sense of me is based on whatever you perceive and assume about what you perceive. So if you investigate directly, not only will your lens of perception purify itself, become more transparent to the way things actually mysteriously, indisputably are directly, but also therefore your sense of self will make great changes, trend, go through transitions. This is why spirituality or self-discovery is a bit of a scary journey for a lot of minds that are dependent, that have grown dependent, reliant for their sense of self on the way they currently assume things to be. That's why it takes courage to investigate our assumptions about perception, about the world, about each other, about phenomena. Because what would it mean? You know, what would I become? What would then be my priority? What would become of all the things that I want to do? What would become of all the things that I hold dear? What would become of all the things that I've put momentum into? If I deconstruct the very nature of perception and with that radically change my sense of being, my understanding of self, my self knowledge, the creator or source or life in the expression of me becoming more transparent of its essential nature. So to purify the chitta, in order to get to the original chitta, the original pure knowing nature, the indisputable state of I am, before words, before assumptions, before concepts, yet every living creature has it, some instinctively, others, like us, have the ability to consciously recognize, reflect upon this essential knowing nature that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be described, without which no perception could be said to exist, without which no phenomena could be assumed to have an independent nature. You could not assume that there is a world had you not had this originally pure, ever-present, indisputable, indestructible, ingraspable, formless, indescribable, mysteriously here nature of self of knowing, being slash knowing, knowing slash being. Those two words combined, I have found to be perhaps the most accurate descriptor overall. It's aware being. It's not two things. The nature of the original chitta or the original self or the essential nature of all phenomena, the essential nature of reality is, if you go back to sort of its root level and you purify your perception and you increase your ability to maintain conscious recognition of that, it begins to reveal itself as the essential kind of empty, kind of full, but indescribable, yet indisputable essence of being. And that being intrinsically, inseparably from that being is aware, the ability to know. So it's knowing, being, being, knowing, knowing, being, aware, being, being, aware, aware, being not two concepts, perhaps two aspects that can be described from our experiential state. But the essence is experienced as indivisible. The knowingness is the beingness. The knowingness is what is, is what is being. And the being is the knowing, the essential knowing, not the knowledge, not the con constructs, but the essence which enables constructs of knowledge, concepts of knowledge. So there's always an essence without an essence that cannot be the form, the expression of the essence. And we have the blessed ability to recognize the essence of ourselves. And with that, to recognize the nature of reality itself, because self is not different from reality, because if there's one, how could it be different? What we are is not distinct from reality, from truth, from source. It's not source and then us somehow, where would we have come from? Where would our senses have come from? What would our minds be made of? 
if not of this essence, if not of source. So the quest for reality and truth is the quest of self and the quest of self or for self, true self, is the quest for reality or truth, the way things actually are, which again, descriptions cannot hold, it cannot grasp, it cannot contain it. It ever escapes, it ever escapes any prison of mind, any concept, any conclusion, yet it ever shines, it's ever available as the essence of knowing. 